Today's episode is brought to you by Gray Block Pizza. Gray Block Pizza, it's, uh, it's exactly what it is, man. It's a pizza. You knew that. Gray Block, 1811 Pico Boulevard in Los Angeles. On the way to the beach, Gray Block. Today's episode is brought to you by Me Undies. If you want to support this past weekend and your crotch is feeling kind of unkempt, then uh, instead of trimming down that bad little badger you got down there, why don't you just get in a nice pair of Me Undies? Me Undies are made from Modal, which is three times more softer than cotton. Take care of your junk and treat yourself well. Go to MeUndies.com slash weekend uh, to get a 15% off um, the individual pairs that you get. So go to MeUndies.com slash weekend to get that 15% off hitter, gang gang. Today's episode is also brought to you by Ridge Wallet. You know, a wallet is something that's been with me, with man for a long time. You know, a lot of times, even if they find caveman's bodies or something like that, um, they'll have a little bag of money near their butt cheek or by their um, Cossack's bone. And that just shows you right there that man has always kept things on him, things of value. Well, the time of having that rear that rear back wallet is over. It's time for that front pocket carry. The Ridge wallet is a front pocket carry that keeps your money and keeps your credit cards and important documents. Quit carrying all them extras, barrettes, and, you know, maybe you might have a little packet of jam or jelly you got from a Burger King one time and you're saving it. Don't carry that. Just carry your Ridge wallet. Go to RidgeWallet.com slash Theo and use code Theo at checkout for 10% off. That's RidgeWallet.com slash Theo and use code Theo for 10% off. And now I want to introduce to you guys a guest that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I've looked up to this guy, even though I've, you know, we know each other, but, you know, um, we know each other kind of like a lot, a lot in passing, um, but he's kind of like, uh, he's a man that I really look up to. And obviously, I'd give anything to have a career like his. Um, he's worked so hard, and he's a true entertainer. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I personally, I I'm tired of joke writers standing on stage and uh, and calling themselves comedians. I'm ready for entertainment because that's what people pay for. And this man gives you your money's worth every single time. I'm so honored. Uh, he's my Michael Jackson. Um, you know him from his countless specials on Showtime and Netflix. He's performed at Madison Square Gardens, dude. Probably the most famous garden since Marvin Gardens or Mr. McGregor's Gardens. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it is uh, it is Mr. Sebastian Maniscalco. <laughs> I can't even imagine how nice it is at your level. I not need the money. You buying probably tomato farms and stuff. What are you buying? Uh, Nick was a premature baby, so he never. He's got a lot of uh, congenital issues. You know, he doesn't know. That he, little does Nick, uh, our producer Nick know that I have uh, huge insurance policies out on him, brother. <laughs> He used to work at uh, Bronson's Comedy Club. I did you really? Out. No, he did. Oh, yeah, Nick did, huh? Yeah, yeah. saw him back in the day. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, you told me you worked there for one week, and they had two great comedians that came through. Who were they? Uh, Sebastian and Jay Larson. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone uh, someone jumped off. Uh, it's on. A, have you ever been there? The, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's on like the third level and looks over into an atrium. So the day I was uh, performing there, I walked in on a Thursday night, and someone had jumped off. Mm. And committed suicide Ooh. right uh, before the show with the line of people waiting to get in. So it's a nice start to the week. <laughs> Dude, I got caught up there. They had a, ch I mean, that's crazy at a mall. Go outdoors. <laughs> you like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, maybe the parking garage or something. Yeah, have but... some respect for shoppers, for your fellow shoppers. Right, right in the middle where they have a, the Santa Claus set up. Oh. So. <laughs> So this is nice. I like the uh, setup here, man. Who, who did this? Uh, Brady Matthews. I don't know if you know Brady. He's a young comedian. He does a lot of impressions. Um, he did this with Chris Farley. This isn't me or Donald Trump. This is Chris Farley. Oh, okay. Uh, a are lot you, of people. Are you a Farley fan? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm a Chris Farley fan. I, uh, I remember I sat behind his brother... Uh, Kevin at the MTV Movie Awards or something a while back and got to sit next to Tim Arnold. No, Tim. 
Who was in Shawshank Redemptions? Tim, uh, who was Tim Robbins. Tim, Tim Robbins. Robbins. Yeah, and it was crazy. And I just remember tapping his brother on the shoulder and being like, man, I'm so sorry about your brother. And his brother looked at me like, shut the fuck up, dude. You don't know him. But now I know Kevin, and it's nice. But yeah, I love Chris Farley. Did you ever work with him? I never did. Uh, Chris Farley, um, I was a huge fan of his and never never met him, never crossed paths. I think he kind of passed away prior to me getting into the entertainment business, so we never, yeah. we never crossed paths. But uh, Dude, so how much? You must have crazy money now. You got money, like, and you're Italian, so you probably have like your baby hiding it around the house and stuff. I bet you, because I watch your Instagram videos, man, and they're they're great. It's nice to see you with the family and everything, yeah. And you, you know, being able to achieve a lot of your dreams and stuff. But I bet low key, you guys are doing some crazy stuff at night around there, hiding cash under the floors and stuff. <laughs> You know? Well, if you know anything about Italians, we we don't talk money at <laughs> That's all. That's a good point. So, uh, but things are good. I'm really enjoying my family, and um, yeah, man, it's it's been really really nice to. Uh, you know, we've talked over the years in regards to like this business and yeah. how you you know break through and whatnot. So it's it's been a long long road, but after twenty years, finally starting to kind of peek my head out of the ground and uh, yeah, and getting some fans so. out of the ground at the bank, bro. I don't know if you know uh, this, <laughs> this guy. Is a financial show. <laughs> no, <it> is, sorry, <laughs> no. And look, uh, Sebastian, you've never seen like a money guy. I'm just I'm just excited for you, I guess. Thank you. And is 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 it weird when? Like if you don't come from money and stuff, and P, is it? It's it's weird to start having money, isn't it? Well, I grew up in a middle class family, northwest uh, suburbs of Chicago, and uh, you know we didn't we didn't have a lot of money by any means. You know, my dad was a, a beautician, my mother was a secretary, and uh, you know we went on vacation once a year, and uh, you know we had two cars. It was it was a it was a nice nice bring up, but yeah, um, like the Wonder Years, something like that Fred Savage kind of Wonder Years kind of style, exactly. Exactly. Um, and now, yeah, I mean, it, listen, I'm not a guy who buys a lot of stuff. I'm not a car guy. I mean, I'm not a, uh, I mean, I like clothes and uh, I like actually sharing the success with my family. Right. Uh, my father, my mother. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, we went out to Italy. I, you know what? You know what I'm going to have to do? Yeah. And I typically don't do this. I got to take off the podcast jacket. It's getting a little warm. Is it really? Well, no. hang it up for you. I'm going to get up and hang it up. For no, this no, minute. no. Okay. Because I'm getting heated talking about you? money. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, yeah, Sebastian, uh, you can really pull that over so you're speaking right down the barrel because you got that cool. little sultry voice. Yeah, I know. It's my music voice. <laughs> well, dude, Thank this you. This guy was probably a couple of weeks away from being a lounge. So <laughs> you know how it is in this business, man. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man, and I put on a nice vest for you too, no, bro. I mean, that's very nice. It's uh, you it's look basic. Well, no, you look well put together. I mean, we do when I used to party, and a lot of our my listeners know this. I used to, you know, get a little bit of drugs, and I would, you know, I had a vest. I would, I bought, I probably bought about six thousand dollars worth of vests, bro. Vests? Yeah. You went on a vest? Uh, oh, s- spree. I'm that armless adventure bear, bro. I'll be oh, out there. Man. Do you ever hug somebody in a vest, bro, with nothing else on? I have. It's pretty <laughs> yeah, it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> I got into a vest. Oh, that's the <laughs> original honeymoon, bro. That's a Greek honeymoon, dude, right there. <laughs> You're right, a vest. But I no, know. I would spend, that's what I spent my money on. And Vests. We, we, yeah. Okay. Over time, now as I get older, this I, I like I collected. You know, some people collect. You might collect nice jackets. You know, you know, some people are shoe guys. Like that's one thing I would like. I had vests. Like for some reason, I got into it about eight years ago, and I've had a collection over the years. So, are you still whipping out those vests? Not as much. I would do drugs at night by myself at home and put them on, bro. You would put a vest on to do drugs. Not do the drugs first, I think. <laughs> you know, the vest, yeah. <laughs> vest came after? The vest were a byproduct, I think, is some of my behaviors. All right. Yeah. Um, but what was some, yeah, you were talking about spending some spending some cash, and you like spending it on your family. And my family. Uh, um, uh, I took my sister, her family, and my mother to Italy this year, and we enjoyed Tuscany together. So that's what I like to do. I like to kind of share because these people have been with me you know for the last 20 years they've come to every show right and they've been very supportive and it's very very I'm, I'm really into family and now that i have a little daughter and my my wife I'm, that's kind of where my my heart is, is is my family so yeah and that's what i talk about in my, in my act not only my 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 family but my father and the whole Italian upbringing, that whole oh, yeah. thing. So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's nice. It's finally nice. I mean, after, you know, I was selling satellite dishes in the mall in a ghetto at one point uh, to, to, you know, get by. Dang. And I went into $10,000 worth of debt. So, 
it was uh it's, it was a struggle as you well know you know and uh and now i'm very grateful that everything is kind of uh working out even and out it's even and out, it's yeah. interesting it's almost do you feel like in some ways like it's um like it's evening out because what's interesting is you don't for me anyway i don't remember almost all the times that i put in that were not valueless but definitely were not a lot of like fiscal reward at all like yeah. all the weekends of flying like you said you went ten thousand dollars in debt same here i think i went like i think i had honestly once i was all said and done almost 20 20 something grand on credit cards just from you know you they pay you six hundred dollars to fly to buffalo for the weekend as a feature you come back you lost four hundred you know yeah like it's just an investment yes but is. all that kind of goes into the past as you start to like you forget about it a little bit like i guess it, it feels like it evens out a little bit uh, well, I think we were compensated probably for all the times that we didn't get paid. So, you know, you're right. kind of making up for that. But uh, I'm well aware of those times where it was slim pickings. <laughs> I, I live in the negative, right? <laughs> so I'm always, you know, things are good now, but I'm always waiting, you know, for that time when people don't come to the show. Oh, yeah. I'm never like these positive guys that you see up on um, on Instagram, like a Gary V or The Rock or whatnot, yeah. or Mark Wahlberg, that whole thing. Like, hey, man, you got to get up. Before, you know, I'm not that guy. I'm the guy who is... You know, I'm waiting to fall off the mountain rather yeah. than to climb up it. Yeah, and that's what kind of keeps me <laughs> motivated. Like you're, like you're paying, like you're talking to the trash guy. Like, look, just let me know when there's some openings over there. Like you're planning ahead. <laughs> well, that's the family I'm from. You know, they're very um, kind of like negative yeah. people. Yeah, and uh, that's kind of how I am. I mean, I try to be positive. Don't get me wrong, but mm -hmm. I live in fear. Yeah. Wow. That's that's uh, that's what keeps me going. Did um, we have a question? Actually, I, I, I wanted to even start the podcast off with this, but podcasts start where they start. Uh, Sebastian Maniscalco is here today, and um, huge fan. So happy to have you here, bro. Thank you so much no, for your thank time. You. Thank, thank you for all you do for comedy, dude. I was watching this clip the other day, and we even put it up because we get a lot of video submissions and, and call submissions. And it was uh, Uber X. It's like hitchhiking with your phone, mm -hmm. and I laughed about it yesterday, and then this morning in the shower. Um, you know, not looking at my body or anything, but I laughed about it again, you know? <laughs> That's good that you're, you're thinking about UberX. That's so show. fucking good, bro. <laughs> UberX is like hitchhiking with your phone. Um, we had a question that came in right here, and let's, let's go to that. Sebastian and Theo, when was the last time you cried? Like sobbing, like really cried. Because I feel like you might have to just do it in your family to just get your point across. But I want to know like, if there's other things going on. Um, not to bring the show down, but my daughter was in the hospital this weekend. Oh. And that's when I, uh, I, ball, I balled. What is it? Tuesday? I balled good. Really? I mean, a good ball. Sunday. Yeah. And I'm a sensitive guy. Yeah. I, I have no problem crying. Yeah. Oh, me neither. I'll cry. I might cry during this podcast. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I cried Sunday because my daughter had a respiratory issue and we went in and, and to see your daughter and tubes and whatnot. That's, mm. that's killer. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm a big crier. Yeah. I'm, I'm the sensitive one in the, in my relationship with my wife. Really? Oh yeah. Movie comes on. I'm like balling. I look over. I go, nothing? You're not feeling this? <laughs> so uh, yeah. Like Bridges in Madison County. You ever see that? I've never seen that. Is that a crier? Oh my God, bro. You might do. You'll lose weight during it. You're going to you're going to shed. You better bring two shirts. Oh, man. You better bring Good two shirts know. into your home theater, bro, because you're going to need one. Oh, Bridges of Madison County is great. Yeah, I've never. It's seen It's a love that. story too. You could watch it with the lady. Um, so and now, what part of it though? Like you're spending time with your daughter. Uh, like was it right whenever you like she got the sickness, or was it? It was something like was there a certain thing that made you think like that really kind of spooked you? That kind of made you tear up. Um, well, it, uh, she was in there for three days, viral infection. And, uh, for me, I was on the road. So uh. my wife had to go and kind of do this all on her own. And mm. then I was going to come home and then she had start to turn around and I'm like, all right, if, if everything's okay, I'll, uh, I'll just do these gigs. But it was one of those things where, you know, with all the shows, all the stuff that's going on, when something like that happens, that's all that matters. The, right. The, the, the child. You could throw the career out the door. The baby. Uh, you don't have a kid, do you? I don't. Yeah. No. I think about it a lot, though. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I'm 45, so I, this happened to me late in life. She's uh, a year and a half almost. So 
when the baby goes down like that, uh, you could you. That's all that matters. That's all that matters anyway. Right. But then when that happens, it's all uh, personifies it like ten times, mm -hmm. and you're like, it really puts you in check. Where you know, you slow down and you go, what is important? This is important. And uh, yeah, good cry though, bro. Yeah, I'm telling you, I, I when I cry. Yeah, take me through. Some yeah, of that. it's um, where does it start? Does it, it start in the face? Does it start in the? It's it's uh, it it comes from the feet. <laughs> oh, dude, yeah, it's, it's 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 a swell from the roots. Huh? <laughs> Oh, you'll see surfers showing up parking outside of his house. This thing is really <laughs> picking up footage in his legs. Yeah, man. Really? In the hips. I could see you being something coming out of the hips even. The, yeah. I think it I think it uh, definitely affects it, the hips on its way <laughs> yeah. up. And uh yeah. Affects no, the hips. It's a good it's a good I think everybody needs a good cry every once in a while just to wash it out. Oh you know? dude. Half this podcast is based on tears, dude. This podcast is built on brackish face water. <laughs> this thing is bad. <laughs> When, when did you last cry? Probably last episode. I mean, I cry almost every other episode in here. Something brings me kind of to tears. We had a moment on this podcast where, this isn't a funny podcast also, by the way, so don't feel like you have any pressure to be funny. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, we had a moment, what was it? You know, the last time I had a good cry, bro, was when, like, you know, my mother was a hard worker when I was growing up, and she still is. You know, my mother delivered newspapers. She's always been a delivery person. And, uh, like, I sent her, like, a 1000 bucks or something a couple weeks ago, you know? And she had told me that, like, a man she'd worked for it was paying her really bad, and he didn't, uh, he was making her do extra work that wasn't included in the original agreement. And my mom's 71 now, so she's out there moving these bundles of papers and everything, and just, uh, so I was like, oh, no, you know, here's this money, you know, a man's not going to treat my mother like that, you know? And for me, it was just like, like, I'd never even told my mother that, or I'd never even you know, started to think as a child, you kind of, you know, I guess you can become your mom's not caretaker, but you, at a certain point, you're not just a son anymore. Like you're kind of like a C and I dog in a way, kind of, yeah. you know? And uh, so that for me was like pretty powerful. And then I'm fucking crying at the house, bro. You know, and I'd been smoking cigarettes. So then I got all depressed probably. And who knows, man, I'll, I'll put on, uh, oh, then I go into a loop that I'll put on Finding Neverland with Johnny Depp. Oh, so you really like, if you're, oh, dude, if you're crying, you're like, you just you're just trying to get more stuff to get you going, <laughs> so, dude. Yeah, it's like really, I ride, I ride this dark. <laughs> just I, I just get into it, man. But that's what got me going, you know. Is uh, was that made me have some emotion? Um, yeah, family's important to me, though. Did you think that you were going to, as your career got along, did you start to worry like, oh, am I gonna? Because at a certain point, you're all in with comedy. Yeah. You know, especially around 15 years. I mean, you were all in. I was all in the f day, day one. Oh, really? Yeah. I never thought I was going to do anything else. I never had a, like a backup plan. I never had like, hey, I'm going to do five years. And then if I don't do it, I'm going to go back home. This was uh, comedy or bust. So wow. for me, there was no, I had no other, I had no skills. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I went to college. I graduated I, with a corporate communications degree. Oh, yeah, and I, I don't really have any other skill sets. Yeah. I mean, if I wasn't doing comedy, I think I'd be a general manager of a um, a five star hotel because I like the hospitality industry. I could I, see that, and I, I was a waiter at the Four Seasons, so I really, really enjoy travel. Yeah, and I enjoy all the nuances of travel, whether it be uh, the airplane, the customer service. Oh yeah, how every how everything works when it comes to travel. Fascinated by it. Really, I could see you doing like high end, like hot air balloon rides, like really high end though. <laughs> I'm talking about going in like endangered airspace, something, you know. Wow. No, I never, I'm not a, I, I've done a hot air balloon ride. I'm not a big, um, that's a safety concern for yeah. me. Oh, right on. Yeah. Okay. Damn. I like to be on the ground. Wow, man. Yeah. You have really a lot of parameters I that do. go along. I do. There's a lot of rules. With that, being uh, Sebastian Maniscalco. Yeah. Um, but did you start to think like, as you're thinking, okay, my career is, is very important to me, or my career, this is my life. You know, it's, it becomes really your life. You miss out on a lot of things as a comedian, that touring that people don't realize. Did you find that? Like you miss out on friends, you know, different experiences? Yeah. Um, I, I, I kind of, as far as friendships are concerned, I, I kind of, um, I don't have a lot. I don't hang around with a lot of people. Yeah. Um, a lot of my friends are still back in Chicago. I mean, I, I still have friends here in LA I've, that I've met over the course of the 20 years that I've been out here, but I never felt a missing with not being around any friendships or, or anything like that. It was, I was so involved in trying, like 
like you, you know, going traveling every weekend, coming home, unpacking, getting getting back uh, on an airplane and, and doing it all over again. So I never really was concerned of what I was missing out on because I knew in the end, whatever I missed out on, I would be able to kind of make up for it uh, in the success of, of doing stand-up comedy. So, you know, I've been working for 20 years and this is the first time this year that I took taken like a good chunk off mm -hmm. to really kind of uh, reflect, enjoy, have like a little balance because with this business i think you got to live life in order to draw from it like mm. that's how i that's how i do my comedy i i don't really get my comedy sitting on an airplane or going into a dark room and writing i get my comedy from going to a uh, a preschool interview you yeah. know just doing just doing the regular <laughs> things of life you know? yeah and, well that's uh, what people want to see they want to see sebastian going through regular life you know? yeah that's what's so fascinating that's what's funny to me yeah that's what's funny to us as viewers as listeners yeah i just think fucking great oh, that, you're like did you hear dude sebastian got stuck standing in line yeah <laughs> Wait, did I you just, hear about this yeah the nuances of life that's observational type humor has been a huge huge uh, yeah. uh, thing with me and i've always loved watching uh other comedians talk about real life situations right. whether it be family whether it be uh friends um going dating whatever whatever it is i really enjoy that the, those those stories opposed to kind of made up stories that someone just conjured up i, I could appreciate it but right. for me to laugh i like i like the pain that another comedian's going through it makes it makes me really really laugh it adds to it yeah there's something there's something that makes you laugh when somebody like gets hurt it always like you know if they don't get hurt really bad like not dead but you know like i saw one time a guy took a took a eight ball off of a pool table we're out in the street and he threw it down the street dude and he hit another dude man and it hit him like in the thigh or something you know someplace it wasn't gonna kill him you couldn't hear it but it man you heard it come out of him it was like it made no sound hitting him and then all the sound coming out of his throat when he just yelled. Yeah, I mean, um, physical pain is, is often funny, but I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm talking more about, like, you know, when I watch you, you talk about growing up and you going to school and that environment that you grew up in school. Not that it was painful, but I, I didn't grow up that way. Right. I don't, I don't, I have no experience that I don't go, oh, that was me. But the fact that the way you tell that story and you bring us into your world, mm -hmm. that's where I find uh, as a viewer that we, when you could cross that and, and, and bring someone who didn't bring up, grow up like you, but you could still laugh at the situations. Right. Those, those, those comedians to me are, are, are a joy to watch. I, I don't particularly like um, the humor that's kind of fabricated out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, you know, one thing I think that you've done for comedy, and I'm, uh, you know, I feel like I'm in a little bit of the wake of that is just bring back like the art of the, an actual entertainer. Um, because for a long time, it seems like it's been about like joke writers. Um, but I feel like anybody could get up there and do that. I want to see the person up there. I want to get my money's worth. That's what I feel like. Um, and I'm sure with a lot of your fans, these guys want to get their money's worth. They probably, you know. People are probably trying to buy you sweat backstage. I mean, I can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah. Especially a lot of uh, uh, Italian men are low-key Liberacis. I feel like not the gay side, but everything else. You know, the flashy silks, you know, the extra sweat glands. I feel like they got a lot going on back there. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of extra sweat glands <laughs> yeah. in the Italian culture. <laughs> um, yeah, man, you think you've hit something on the head there where they bring in the entertainment uh, aspect of, uh, especially in stand-up comedy. You know, you have... You know, there's something to be said about going to a show and seeing a kind of spectacle or a guy or a woman up there really, really entertaining, exposing yes. their soul. Yes, and, uh, and trying, making an effort. Effort. Not this crybaby comedy. There's so many people just like who are well off, but they're just crying about life. It's like, I'm, I don't get that, man. I, I feel like I owe it to the people. Now more than ever, you do, you do, and and for these people to come out and see what we do, I've always, I've always looked at it as like you're coming into my house, and uh, I'm gonna, I'm, yeah, like yeah, if you come take over, your shoes off, yeah, <laughs> take your shoes off, number one. <laughs> But uh, if you're coming over to my house, I'm going to make sure if, like, I, I'm, a, I'm a big observer and, and I'm looking at what you got. You got coffee, you got juice. I don't know if you, you, you typically drink that, but I'll make mental notes of what, right. you, you, what you like. If I have a party, 
I will make sure that if if you're a drinker and I know you drink Jack, that Jack Daniels will be at the party. Yeah. That's kind of how I do with my shows. Like I, I if you're gonna come to the show, a I'm going to take care of you with the entertainment. Mm -hmm. B I always used to go out and and meet the people after the show. Yeah, take photos. That's where I'm at right you. now for sure. And if you get that one on one connection with somebody, uh, you'll have a fan for life. I'm telling you, and, and you're doing it the right way. Where you go out there, and you like you're appreciative of these people coming out. And oh, I'm so bucks, grateful. You know? So that's kind of what I did for the last 10 years. I was outside, hanging outside comedy clubs. Whether there was 12 people in the audience or 300, I would wait till everybody left, took a picture with everybody. And I wasn't doing it. Uh, I, I wanted to do it, number one. And number two, I knew if I did do it, the people would come back and we feel like kind of like we're making it uh, together. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and, and my fans are the people I would probably hang out with. They're families, they're like groups, they come in like packs. You yeah. know, the whole neighborhood will come out. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's, it's great. Um, it's no, it seems like it's been great, man. Um, let's take a, I want to make sure we include some of these. Let's take another one of these uh, video calls. And none of this is live either. We can edit any of this out. Well, this is uh, fascinating to me because I don't do a lot of uh, podcasts. Um, right, you and Pete had one for a while. Do you still have it? Yes. We okay. Do. We do. And uh, it's called the Pete and Sebastian Show. We do it once a week. But, you know, the fact that you got, like, ugh, video callers and, and all this, it fascinates me in the sense that is this your brainchild? Is this, did you go, listen, I want to be in a room. I want this. I want. Th I want the look of it. I want th uh, the video. Mm -hmm. Or is this a collaboration that you're coming up with with a group of people? I'm always right. curious to find out, like, how much of it is the person that's doing this, and or how much is a, is somebody going? No, yeah, we're gonna do video call, and you go, oh, you got video call, or did you see this somewhere else and go, we got to have that on our show? Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, here's what happened. So I was shooting the podcast at home out of my kitchen. You know, um, and because I'm Polish Nicaraguan, I don't even know if you know that we do a lot of work out of the kitchen, you know, <laughs> and uh, we're fucking kitchen people. And um, and so I was shooting it there. There's a pizza, there's a pizza place called Gray Block Pizza. The guy hit me up. He's like, hey, man, I love your podcast. I'm going to give you a thousand bucks a month. You know, just grandfather me in on the podcast. I want you to get out of your kitchen. I want you to get into a studio. So that gave me just enough money because I had saved up like $800 from little ads and stuff. And that had been after about a year to get into a studio. And then once we did that, this was my, this was like the nicest piece of art I have, still have in my life right here. This was at the house. I was like, we got to get this in here. Fighter and the Kid, this was their old studio. They're now through the wall right here. Ruin one of Brendan's takes. He's taking some shit over there right now. <laughs> um, so this was their old studio. He got laid off from Corolla one night for drinking too much at a party. Fucking picked that dude up on the fucking free agent wire, 100%. Um, and with that along the way is that fans have been here as we've just struggled with a lot of stuff and dealt with stuff. And uh, and it's been fascinating, man. And now we have, like, we get two and a half million listens a month, and it's absolutely crazy, bro. So what was the, your... Uh, what was your tipping point here where you kind of um you know really exploded and was it was it your comedy was it the podcast is the podcast feeding the people coming out to see your shows is it vice versa that that you have such a big swell of stand up uh, comedian fans that they are now listening to your podcast i'm i'm fa fascinated with the podcast world just because where or is it the your fact that you go on Joe Rogan you pick up that how, how does right. it work I don't know. You know, I think it's a big it's a big mix. I mean, my, the producer Nick has definitely helped. You know, because he helps with social media elements um, and a lot of inspiration. And he knew about podcasting. I think the the you know fifteen years of doing stand up and having the stand up to back it up when people have started to come out. That's where I'm at right now. Is people are just starting to come out to the shows. Mm -hmm. Like I just started like selling out some places like a couple of months ago. Really, within the past five months. So it's been. Um, and Rogan definitely helped. I mean, undeniably, he had me on like twice within like two months. And that was like, you know, that really, really helped a lot. Mm. Fighter and the Kid's been really good to me, those guys. Um, Coco Diaz, Joey Diaz. Um, who else? That's been a lot of it. And yeah. then showing up every week for the podcast. 
uh, has been, you know, the, the fans appreciate that. I, th- I think a lot of it has come from your podcast appearances, but like just going on them isn't what does it. He goes and he delivers and yeah. they're like, I got to hear more of this guy. So then they look him up. Like there's a lot of people that do the podcast circuit, but they don't see the numbers increase like he, he gets when he does an appearance. Yeah. And, and it, he may it, know that better because he's a, you know, uh, he knows about the podcast. Because I know when I saw you on the podcast, it would, and also when I saw you on stage, which I've never seen before, and I don't know if this is something new that you're doing, but your way of using vocabulary and your, the way you string words together, like it's, it's very unique. And I was wondering myself, and this, this appearance on this show is more of a learning experience for me as well. Cause I, I, I to tell you the truth, I always really wanted to discuss this with you. Is it, did this, did this come out of nowhere? This language that you do? I mean, it, yeah. literally these, these, it's almost like a stream of consciousness where you're like, what, how do you even pair those words together? And it's the way you deliver the words. Is yeah. this something that happened recently? Cause I don't think I've ever seen it before. And I don't, maybe I wasn't just paying attention, but where's this, where's this language coming? No one talks like yeah. you. I don't know. You I think it <laughs> lives in the back of my neck, man. Is, is, it like, coming, is it coming from your hips? I think it might be, bro. <laughs> It's that fucking Clint Eastwood, baby. I'm yeah, that, you man. know, I'm that queso and sommelier bad boy. You know, it's like you just don't know what can be paired up. That's the thing. Well, that's a, it's just, it's just it's it's really fun to watch. I mean, I'm not blowing shit up. Uh, no, you know, I appreciate I'm, I'm it. I'm just saying it's it's fun to watch. And, and I remember watching you on. Uh, you were doing Yahoo News or yeah. uh, an, uh, an entertainment oh, thing it was for, so horrible. for a little bit. I and, had to comb my hair and it was falling out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, I was, dude. I, the the best guy I interviewed over at Yahoo was uh, Mike Rowe. Remember him from Dirty Jobs? Yeah. Dude, that guy was the best. He said he tried for 12 years to sell that show, Dirty Jobs. Really? And people told him, nah, nah, nah. Wow. And finally he got it, and then it was a hit. Excuse me, guys. I know uh, we were learning Italian there from the king himself, uh, uh, Mr. Maniscalco, but I got to tell you about something. You know, a lot of people's breath stinks. And a lot of people aren't taking care of them little bad boys in their mouth. And I'm talking about their teeth. Do you know that people brush their teeth every day and that they often do it wrong? You know, a lot of times we feel like the first way we learn to do something and we just keep doing it that way. Well, I used to put my shoes on first and then my socks. And people thought I was an idiot. Was I? I don't know. But, but there's a, a better way to brush your teeth is what I'm trying to tell you. And that is with Quip. Q-U-I-P. Quip is a better electric toothbrush created by dentists and designers. It was designed to make brushing your teeth more simple, affordable, and even enjoyable. A lot of people, they brush their teeth too hard and they're just, gr- they're just beating their teeth. It's like they're just like beating a baseball bat against a dirty Chevrolet. And that's not what you want to do. You want to you want to you want to take care of your teeth properly, and that's what Quip does. It has a built-in two-minute timer that pulses every thirty seconds to remind you when to switch sides, and it declutters your sink or cabinet and makes traveling with an electric toothbrush way easier. You just charge it once, and it stays for three months on one charge. No more old bristles, none of that, and that's why I love Quip because it's new, it's fun, and it gets the job done. They're backed by over 20,000 dental professionals, and it starts at just $25. So go to getquip.com slash weekend right now, and you'll get your first refill pack for free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's right, your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash weekend. That's G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash weekend. Take care of your mouth. Take care of your breath. Take care of yourself. Get yourself. That means yourself and your health at the same time. Yourself. Get quip. And now back to this wild Italian. Um, did you ever start? Did you? Do you feel like you always like? Did you start to get scared? I, I, I honestly like I noticed like in the past couple of months I started to get like some fear. Like, am I supposed to be doing something right now? Like when things have started to pick up in the in the entertainment industry and just be busier. Did you have anything like that? Like, what was some of that? Like, when you're like, wow, is this just, like, excitement? Or is this, like, my career's taking off? Like, you, did you have, like, so any visceral reactions to it? I don't know what visceral means either. I don't know what, <laughs> okay. it, I don't know what it does either, but it sounds like it's a really powerful word. Um, I, uh, I learned to, um, I, 
Well, no, I, I don't think it's fear. Yeah, I think it is fear. Uh, like I always live in fear, yeah. but <laughs> I, um, I'm i always fearful. But as far as like doing other things, it's like sh I never wanted to spread myself thin. I don't want to do stuff just to do it. Right. Um, I don't want to go on a, on a show where, you know, it's a, here, for example, like a talking head show, like mm -hmm. a Chelsea Handler show type show. I, I, I don't like doing those shows because I just know it doesn't showcase me in a good way. I don't like vying for the attention of, uh, of a host or whatnot. It's just not my style of humor. It's more a little bit laid back and kind of just comes and goes. And I, I'm not the guy who's like always on or wants to get in. So, right. Um, yeah, you're not that guy. Yeah, I just didn't. I just didn't want to do shows, and I have nothing against the show. It just doesn't showcase me in the right, right. way. And I felt like when that was happening, I'm like, oh man, do do I have to be on these shows to to sell tickets? Because it seems like everybody that goes on those types of shows was was doing was selling out. Really, Remember, yeah, really Fortune, well. Josh Wolf, all those guys. Yeah, and you sit there and go, well, no, I'm just gonna stick to my guns, and I'll find another outlet or I'll find my own way. I just know that that way for me is just uh is, is not going to showcase me well that's why sometimes i don't like doing podcasts just because sometimes i feel like oh you know uh, i gotta be funny or, or you know is, is this something that people are gonna go oh is it, you know, I, I don't know I, I don't know what's interesting about me mm -hmm. i i just i'm i'm, I'm sometimes i'm like why do why does someone want to hear my story and yeah when, when i wrote a book i'm like do i really do, do people really want to read what i've been through i felt like i didn't even have a book in me you right know, I, didn't, I didn't have cancer and overcome <laughs> it or i didn't have like this big you know yeah you weren't sex traffic yeah <laughs> <laughs> There was nothing that I like. I just came out here twenty years ago to do stand up, and yeah. there's been some some uh, ups and downs, peaks and valleys. But do people really want to know that? I don't know. I, I I that's why I have a hard time with the social media too. It's like I look at some of these guys, and I'm like, geez, man, they they're up there every day. And yeah. This hey, I'm here. I'm here. I'm like, I'm struggling to get like one one post every seventy two hours. Yeah. You know, just because I'm thinking in my head, I go. If people really want to know that I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this, so it's that been I'm desperate. A... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> I think you do it good, though. Well, I mean, I, I really do. I just, I just try and <laughs> if I do something, I, I just want it to be funny. And uh, a lot of the stuff that I put up there, I, this is what I do. I film it. I look at. It, I go, this sucks. <laughs> Nobody wants to see this. And I and I erase it. Yeah. Or if my wife's in it, she goes, "Hold on, I got to look at." It. It's like it's a, it's, a, it's a whole it's a whole thing, a whole ordeal. So it's been th that's been a kind of a struggle for me of how to f how to figure out the uh, social media game. Yeah, where I where I'm in because I don't have a lot of followers. If you look at my followers and then you look at the people that come out to see my show, they really don't correlate. You oh, know? that's got to be interesting. So then that's not even where a lot of your market is even at then. Well, you know, it's an older market. It's a, it's not a, a market um, that's that's a younger, I skew kind of older families, parents, whatnot. Although I do have a, a lot of kids, like 12, 13-year-old kids that really enjoy the facial expressions and what have you. But, um, you know, Face, Facebook is, is is a place where a lot of them live, but you know, you know, you look at my Instagram and Twitter; it's it's relatively low numbers compared to you know a lot of the people out there that uh, that have in the millions. Yeah, and, uh, and no, it's like it's, Ariana Grande; she has seventy or eighty million. Yeah, and Pete Davidson; he's starting to look like her mood ring. I feel like whatever mood she's in, that's what color he dyes his hair. <laughs> you notice that? That's what I'm feeling like. I've seen a guy have four different hair colors. <laughs> I feel That's like it's funny. red when it's that time of the month too. They dye it oh, red on Pete. That's a bit much. Um, can I can I have this? Is this for me? Yeah, it sure is, man. A is buddy it? of mine. This is his new company, but they're they've been killing it. But all right, it's like um, it's like two calories or something. It's safe. Peach. That's nice. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> Did you think that um? Did your wife have to talk you into fatherhood, or was it something that you wanted to do? Um, put it this way. I was never a guy who wanted uh, kids. Like I was like 20. I'm like, oh, yeah, I can't wait to have kids. But as I got older in life and a little bit more secure in my, my job and, and, and I was stable, uh, started having a family was one of my priorities, and so glad I did. It's like one of those things that you hear time and time again, man, I wish I would have done this 
a little bit younger, but actually the timing of it all really, really worked out. I mean, it's, 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 no, I, I, I was not talked into this. I wasn't talked into, me. I, I don't have this relationship where it's like the, the woman is like, we got to get married. It's, right. It's not like that. And my wife is super, super opposite than, than me. And that's why it works and um, never pressures me to do anything. It's, it's not that type of relationship, but uh, having a kid for, for us is, man, it's really something special. Yeah. And do, wh like, what is like, what is it brought out of you that you didn't know? Cause I mean, I, I'm kind of fascinated by that. You know, I'm scared. Like I get scared about that kind of stuff. I get scared. Like I won't be able to, you know, um, like I'll mess up the relationship and the family and then I won't be there for my, you know, like I just get, I don't know. I just get, I have a lot of fear, I guess, about that kind of stuff. Did you have any fears about it? Um, or is it just wasn't something you were interested in? No, not, not necessarily fears. It was, first of all, doing it with the right woman. Mm -hmm. I don't know how the hell these people have kids and they can't stand their <laughs> wife. For their, I, I, don't, I, I don't know how that even works. Yeah. For a, I mean, you got to love the person you're with in order to bring a child into this life because I'm just, in my personal opinion, looking at the, the, the trials and tribulations of parenting. If you're doing that with someone you can't stand, yeah, God, does that suck. So a Muppet out there. Yeah. <laughs> Some ladies in her car all night eating chips and everything and drinking big sodas, bro. <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> Dude, yeah. this lady in our neighborhood, bro, she used to say that she lived by us, but she would just park out there and drink big sodas in her car. Straight out of a two-liter, dude. No wow, straw, nothing. Man. To the dome, bro. That is aggressive. She was aggressive, man. She used to also deliver cookies for a while, but she got laid off from there. Anyway... <laughs> Man, did you just you closed your eyes? Oh, on I like going you see home, that? man. Like man, going you, you were like reliving that. I thought it was like, you look like a, a singer, or almost like reliving that moment. Jeez, I've never seen someone close their eyes while they're telling a, st <laughs> Dude, a story before. Bro, I'm the Smokey Robinson of bullshit. <laughs> let's uh, let's let's bring in another video question. We got some great ones. Hello, Theo, Sebastian, and all this past weekend listeners. I am a dark arts enthusiast from Turkey, and I just freaking love this podcast, and I love both of you guys. But I just had a question for Sebastian because I remember him talking about being a shy guy growing up and was just wondering how did he get out of his shell and decided to pursue comedy. I would just love to hear more about his upbringing. Thank you. Yeah, because you're shy. You're like, who you are on stage doesn't fit with who you are 100%. Like, people probably expect you to just fucking just juggle in front of them and fuck their buddy or fuck their <laughs> female buddy. You know what I'm saying? Though? Like, people expect this. Yeah. Um, no, I'm I'm quite a, I'm like a loner. I'm like a lone wolf. Um, I, I, Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I. Growing up, I was never the class clown. I was always the quiet kid. I uh, really, really enjoyed getting up in front of the class and doing a book report or what have you. Because <clears throat> this is the way I, what have you. This is great. <laughs> I just looked at people when they went up in front of the class, and it was boring to me watching them. Yes. And I'm like, come on, man. This is like we're here for three hours. Give us something. You the know? guy's like, I'm here for the Indian in the cover guy. I'm fucking nervous as hell. Just give me a minute. He's in the, he's in the back with a lion's whip in the back. <laughs> Yeah, man. I don't know. I was, I wanted to be entertained, right? In in school, and uh, I felt like I'm like, wow, these people. Like I felt like um, we weren't getting our money's worth. Yes. And I felt like I can't wait to go up because I know <laughs> I am really gonna make these people laugh. I not, not necessarily read the book or anything like that. Yeah. I kind of masked my uh, inability to um, do the work mm -hmm. with the humor. Right. And that's where I felt, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's where I felt. Uh, I can relate to this, man. <laughs> yeah. So like you made people laugh and maybe you forgot why you were there in the first place. Yeah. That's kind of how I grew up. And I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really, I wasn't the popular kid. I, I was kind of on the outskirts. I played soccer. I didn't play football. Really? I was, uh, I hung out with a bunch of guys from another school. So oh, when that I, creep. 
<laughs> well, nothing, nothing fits your own life. No, man. I, I was, I've always been on the outer perimeter of what's going on. Whatever's popular, yeah. I'm always on the outside, kind of looking in, and that's uh, been the story of my life. I've never been the popular guy. I've always kind of done my own little thing, mm. and uh, and that's it. So, so this question that this this uh, woman from Turkey had asked, it, it was. It, I feel more comfortable on a, on a stage talking to people than I do in environments like this. Yeah. Cause then I, I tend to like edit myself. I tend to be a little bit more reserved. I don't uh, talk off the cuff. Everything's kind of, I don't know. I get in my head a lot when I'm, when there's like two or three people around me. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like, the fun, I'm not fun guy. It's it's not who I am, but you got to admit that we need more Mexican people in the NBA, though. You got to admit that. <laughs> you <know? laughs> like you got to admit. Yeah, it, yeah. No, the quota of Mexicans in the NBA is low, and we need. It's more. way too low. I don't know if you've ever seen Mexican guys play basketball or not, but it's. No, I haven't seen a lot. Why is it? Oh, um... it's thirty on thirty with a soccer ball. <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's, and Jason, uh, Jason Galern, you know him, he's a comedian. Yeah. He's like, yeah, and every shot is an 11-pointer. <laughs> <laughs> but we just need, yeah, I oh. feel you, man. I, I mean, I think I feel you there. It's like, yeah, like, uh, well, I think it makes sense. If you're on the outside, then you can get a perspective. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. I never thought of it that way, but I, I've always been the guy kind of looking in and uh, never really part of the group. Never, never part of any type of group. It's but just, do you want to be part of the group? Though? Some, sometimes, yeah. I want to like, like, why? Like, it, it, I'm like, why am I not in that, or why am I not doing that? This is early on in my career, right? I think. With work, yeah, yeah. But not necessarily with friends. I feel like I'm very comfortable of, of the people in my life, whether it be family or friends, and I've never really yearned to be a part of a social group. However. Uh, I do miss being part of a team. Mm. Um, I played team sports growing up, and yeah. I do miss the com camaraderie of going to, to and hanging out and busting balls and all that stuff. That that I do miss. And uh, but you know, because comedy's so lonely. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. I, I I do miss a group. Yeah, and it's interesting. And as you get more famous, um, it's tougher to get into a group almost because a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Like if people know who you are, it becomes. Um, you know, you feel like you have to almost not check yourself, but just make sure that you're at a comfortable level, you know? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, any any type of like group activities and, and, and my wife and I are kind of not struggling with this, but it's like we've moved into another chapter in our life with having a baby. So now we are looking for people with those shared experiences. We're looking for parents to kind of hang out with. Right. And, uh, you know, with, with Serafina, my daughter, who is going into preschool in another year, mm. we, we feel like we're going to be introduced to a whole new group of people, and uh, which is going to be... <laughs> <laughs> I feel sorry for these people for some reason. He doesn't say much. <laughs> Uh, no, but like I'm, I'm, I'm wanting that too. I'm wanting like I like to have people over at the house. Whether you know, new people is fine. I'm not saying I, I'm not going to have any new friends. Right. I'm just saying it's kind of difficult at this time. Um, and forget the career. I'm just saying to really find um, people that you kind of mesh with. Yeah. In, in my mid forties, you know what I'm saying? It's right. like. Uh, it's 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 a challenge. Yeah, and you won't just take anybody. Like when I'm 11 or 12, I'll take anybody. Asthma, fucking one, <laughs> you know, no arms. You know what I'm saying? Some fucking turtleneck jockey or whoever. I'll take anybody. Some dude with ants all over his body. When you're like seven years old, you'll befriend anybody. Some dude all boog collecting boogers on his shoulder. You know, like yeah. you'll. But as an adult, it's like you. So many things you're like, uh, uh, you know, not for me. Yeah, I think just over the years you kind of like uh, kind of know what you like and don't don't like and uh, yeah, but it's going to be an exciting time now that my my daughter's going to be in the school. And we're going to be introduced to a whole different group of people. What's her first Halloween co or what's this Halloween costume? You guys have it picked out yet or no? Still working on it. Last year she was a. Um, we brought a big pot mm -hmm. and she, gnocchi. Uh, well, she was pasta. Oh, she was like a little, a little. It was it was a hit. <laughs> it was a hit, bro. And we were the chefs. So. Oh, there you go, dude. 
So uh, we got to top that, and uh, we don't know yet. My <laughs> wife's still. My wife's super creative. She's an yeah. artist. That's why I asked who did this. Um, ah. And uh, and she's super creative. I mean, outside the box creative. It's sick. I met her. She's a beautiful lady. Yeah, we, thank you. We we met you. We, we talked to you. This is about five, maybe five, six years ago at the Improv. Um, and that's I think that's the first time you met her. Yeah. Yeah, and you have a sister, too, that uh, almost came out or was going to come out to see my show. Maybe it was an Oxford. I don't remember, but I canceled. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Canceled on your sister, bro. <laughs> but, hey, that's a gentleman in your book, probably. <laughs> that's right. You know, any guy that right. doesn't take your sister out, you know. <laughs> did you ever reschedule that? I did reschedule it. It was okay. It was good out there. You know, I thought the service was a little weird at the club, but I thought everything else was good. Dude, who told me a good story the other day? Uh, oh, Stan Hope did some shows there. He had Johnny Depp come out to watch him. Oh, wow. At the Oxnard Improv. They just put a chair off to the side, in the crowd, but off to the side. Johnny Depp sat there the whole time, watched him. Then they went in the groom and stayed in there all night just drinking and smoking cigarettes. Did the crowd know he was there? Did... Towards the end, people started to know. Oh, wow. So I'm sure like when half the audience is just staring at fucking Tim Burton's little side piece, you know? <laughs> I bet it got interesting. What was it? What was it, uh, Halloween like when you were a kid? Do you remember any? Yeah, it was um, one outfit was the Hulk. I remember it was the Hulk, Hulk pajamas, but my wife put a snow suit, my wife, my, my mom put a snowsuit on me. <laughs> And then put the pajamas over the snowsuit, and that was uh, one of the. Oh, outfits. that's a good idea. And then another one was Rocky. I was Rocky, and how uh, many kids were Rocky then? A lot, but I, I had like a really bad Rocky outfit. I had a Rocky kind of taped with medical tape to the back of the robe. A lot of the outfits mm. were not not like high end yeah. at all. It was it was like piecemeal. Oh yeah. We had a guy who just drew a swastik on his back one time. Jeez. Can you hear me? <laughs> oh, oh, there it is. Oh, there we go. They got, oh, my God. That's illegal, bro. <laughs> oh, this is a Chinese family reunion right here. This is absolutely adorable. Oh, oh, that's so cute. When you look at your daughter now, can you remember her being like that? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. I mean, she is small. I'm looking at her now. I'm going, wow, she's really grown. But, yeah, that seems like it was yesterday. But, uh yeah, man, it's great. I mean, you have a little baby like this, and you're doing these things, and seeing the smile on her face, and she's talking now. She's just starting to walk. It's it's really cool. You got to get one, man. I'm thinking about it, man. I want to get my sperm tested somewhere. I, you know, they do all this other stuff where you can get everything tested. I just... Wait, wait, wait. You want to get the sperm tested? Yeah, just to make sure, you know, that I'm, at, you know... That you could have a baby? Yeah, that kind of a baby, you know. So you just... Do you, you have a girlfriend? Yeah, I got a girlfriend. I've been seeing this white girl. She's good, <laughs> an adult, bro. These days, look, that's a good qualification, man. Uh, white and an adult. Yeah, look, right. let's take this. I, mean, I would, yeah. I mean, I would go any race or ethnicity. I, I don't think not. No, not gender. Yeah, I'd go any race or ethnicity. But yeah, this she's white adult. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um but we'll see you know we're figuring it out man you know i i struggle with that kind of stuff i've always struggled with commitment you know you never really had a long-term study no i've always been uncommitted in relationships i think i've been uncommitted in my relationship with myself even when i really think about it like in my own life you know like eh, we'll see if this takes you know well how old are you 38 oh, okay yeah man i think uh i think this is good for you maybe um Maybe you uh, settle down with the the white girl. No, well, it could be. Look, it could happen. <laughs> you don't know. What, what was the number one thing? Like, is it like because you see a lot of people that are real fuck buddies out there, and the next thing you know, they're broken up by you know by Thanksgiving. You know, a lot of these things. You know, relationships these days. It doesn't even seem to be something a lot of kids are doing. Seems illegal almost another couple months in America that shit will be illegal to even. You're right, man. I mean, compared to when I was single um, with all these apps and what have you, it just seems like, uh, you know, people are swiping, meeting, and, you know, they screw on the sidewalk and then they go on to the next guy, yeah. the girl. It's, uh, it seems like, it seems frightening actually what's going on out there. I don't even know how, Very the, scary. Hell, how the hell. Uh, people are doing it. It's, um, I mean, I've been out of the dating scene for 10 years, so I, I don't even know how I would even fit into that. Yeah. Did you have a go-to kind of date that you used to do back in the day or anything? Um, uh, I love dating. I love really? dating because I love the, the actual... hospitality of it? The date. I love the actual <laughs> See, date of it. unbelievable. I mean... <laughs> You're going to end up working at the Pearly Gates. Who's the guy they got there now? St. Peter? 
You're gonna, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna get that guy. <laughs> it's funny. I, welcome to heaven. <laughs> no, like, we got a four top. Just hold on. One second. <laughs> yeah. One second. Um, no, I loved going and picking the girl up. Yeah. Getting in the car, surprising her with a little place that you know. <laughs> Some music. Now, would you put music on in the car? Not or no? in the car. I'm not a not a music guy in the car. I'm not really a music guy in yeah, general. Me neither. Uh, but I love going. Like she'd go, where are we going? Like, nah, that's a little surprise, you know. I never, <laughs> never really told her. Like I, I, like I'd find like um, it's a place in Chicago called Pops for Champagne. I remember taking a girl. I was in like nineteen and yeah. took her downtown to the city. Like a lot of other guys were just like either, hey, come over, let's go into the movies. I'd go on the uh, the, the expressway, thirty minute drive, wow. pull up pops for champagne, <laughs> had a fake ID, sit down, watch a little jazz. Yeah. You know, like I just love the experience of the actual date. Yeah, going out and showing a girl a good time, and and uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's kind of that was my go to. That's what I loved loved to do. I could see that the service, yeah, just that service industry. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a good date. I took a girl on one time. I think there was some man. I don't know. I, I definitely got a. I was always running around. Like what's your, like like what's your idea of like a, like you're gonna get to know a girl? What are you doing? Like you, hey, let's go for call. Like what's the, what are you doing? Probably go for a like a walk, like a local walk. Probably do. I don't know. I don't like getting. I don't know if I like getting to know people that much, you know. So I think probably something. A, a local walk. What, what is that? Is that opposed to where? Like going somewhere? Like getting lost? I guess. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I think I can get an adventurous if I don't have on, uh, you know, running clothes. You know what I'm saying? I ain't going for a fucking nine mile walk in one direction, bro. That's really dangerous, man. So do you like? Uh... Like, That's a good question, man. Do you like food? I mean, do you like trying new foods? Different? No. None, none of that. You know what's funny when you said music? I never really got into music that much. A but, lot of people from your area, I know a lot of those guys are into like, you know, wrestling in their backyards and shit like that. And like, um, who is that? Uh, Bruce Springsteen, probably, huh? My area? Yeah. Wrestling in yards. Yeah, I feel like Chicago. It's like a place where people wrestle in their back, like do backyard <laughs> wrestling and Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> And no, that's not. No, we didn't. We didn't do. We didn't. I didn't live in that area. Yeah, <laughs> I'm from Wisconsin. You know? We had a lot of that. So. Oh, there you go. Yeah, very like, close. Maybe up north of Wisconsin. It might be a little were, off they base. Were, <laughs> they were diving off the roof. My mother's from Peoria, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. So is that where you picked up that Chicago is is, is the backyard <laughs> wrestling in Mecca? Um, a lot of bad intel. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, I grew up in Arlington Heights. There was not a lot of wrestling. I, I was into wrestling, but yeah. we weren't doing it in the yard. <laughs> yeah, there was none of that. Uh, <laughs> there's none of that going on. Let's go to one of these, Nick. And we got a voicemail this one. Okay. On your special, why would you do that? I was wondering if you can just speak to that crazy outfit you were wearing and kind of your thought process behind it. Thanks. You are a master of ceremony. I mean, you are. What's the one you look like a... Kind of like a maitre d' on yeah, the DMA. Was, was that it? That was that the, the, the why would you do that? <laughs> yeah, that, dude, that, that, fucking... that was a vest, but the vest. Oh yeah, I saw that. Was built into the shirt. Oh right? yeah, you don't see that too often. Uh -uh. This is my this is my whole deal with the uh, outfits. Uh, sometimes I feel like if you wear something a little bit off the beaten path, mm -hmm. and people are switching channels it catches their eye you know even if you were just scrolling you'd see that and go what the what the hell is this guy wearing yeah and a great they would point. they would maybe just stop that's kind of my plus i thought it was uh, you know it kind of fit what i was doing for that particular special uh i'm always doing something a little different i had like um mm -hmm. uh black and white spat shoes on for that i don't know I, it's for me it's uh that's just a good point. Not, not being not being so ordinary, I guess. Talk about entertainment. Like you, you know, trying to be, you know, just entertain people, not only with the material and the physicality of it all, but also with the outfit. Um and a lot of I got a lot of shit for that saying, what, what the hell are you wearing? What, what are you uh, yeah. a penguin? What are you waiting tables or whatnot? You yeah, know, people a, say what they want to say, that's fine that everybody's got their own opinion, but I just uh I just wanted to be a little bit off the beaten path. Yeah, it's like the WWE meets kind of Tony Roma a little bit, you know? 
<laughs> but I'm and I'm just joking. Uh, I mean, and I appreciate you letting me even make fun of you, dude. No, um, man, that's, 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 believe me, I got my I I grew up in a family and friends <laughs> rip each other to shreds. So I'm not. That, this is nothing. Was there some moments when it was weird? So you walk back into your family and you're becoming a star, you know? And you know, and um, and I don't call you that because I feel like you expect me to call you that. You know, I call you that uh, a star because you know you've earned it and you've worked your way so hard in that. You, you know, like. You're going to be known as that. Um, but was there a moment when you go back into your house when you almost, it's not like you have to keep your ego in check, but you got to just kind of make sure you know where you are a little bit because your ego is this thing that can kind of grow inside you and be like a real dirty boy, you know? I've never really even thought of it. My family keeps me so like level headed <laughs> that I've never even thought, well, I'm, you know, doing well or I'm a star or whatever. It never even enters my mind. My sister, my mother, my father, my wife. They, uh, you know, they joke. It's all a joke. It's, it's, uh, e even if I did say something that would be a little bit more like, uh, like I was acting as a star, they go, we, we, big shit now. <laughs> so it's, it's all like in fun. And there's never been a moment where I'd actually had to check myself because there's no really check. I mean, I'm, I'm just a guy doing stand up comedy that uh, happens that a lot of people come out and see me do what I do. So, right. Nothing's really changed for me with my relationships. So you don't have to, yeah, okay. So you weren't thinking of like, oh, they're going to look at me different or they're going to think of me different. No, they're very proud. They're very excited. They, they, they've been there from day one. They know the journey. They know the, uh, you know, all the, 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 the failures I've gone through as well as the successes. So they know it, they know it inside and out. And, um, I've never had to stop and think otherwise. Hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, I guess maybe it's in my own house. I just know my family, like half of them, like, you know, we've always been like such fighters and stuff and angry and like, like I remember what, nobody had fun in my house unless somebody was crying, bro. Oh, really? And if somebody was eating a piece of meat, you get them to cry, bro. It's hard to swallow meat and cry at the same time because your throat's trying to work both ways, you yeah, know? Yeah, that is a tough deal. Oh. It's crying and ain't eating meat. I've never even really heard of that. Oh, be some <laughs> bad skirt steak in your throat, son? <laughs> and you start tearing up. <laughs> Bro, you fucking get lost, dude. <laughs> Straight up bridge to Terabithia in your throat. <laughs> what else you got here? Another voice, man. Okay. Hey, what's up, Theo? This is a question for Sebastian. I was just curious who is his comedy influences starting in his career. Peace. Comedy influences. I uh, grew up watching Three's Company. John Ritter was a huge, yeah. huge uh, influence on me. Noises that, Off. Have you seen that? <clears throat> no. It's a movie that he was in. It's really, really neat. No, I haven't seen that. Um, but his his uh, depiction of John Ritter with the physical comedy was always. Um, I learned a lot watching him. I mean, I'd watch Three's Company like game tape. You know, I <laughs> I would just look at his. Uh, he he could just do a, a movement with his head, and you would just know how he was feeling it was all a lot of facial and pratfalls and physicality there's one episode that really sticks out when he was trying to uh, sit on a hammock and the hammock kept flipping <laughs> over and the way he would flip over and look surprised it, it was just really really brilliant stuff so him uh, johnny carson i always uh, loved uh, brian regan uh, jerry seinfeld george carlin I grew up in the eddie murphy days yeah uh, Dice Clay, I, I've looked at his career and just to talk about a spectacle and making a show a show. I opened up for him for two years. So the way he would, you know, and we've had talks about this uh, uh, off stage. He would say, you know, it's entertainment. It's 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 larger than life, and and you know, and that's kind of kind of learn just just talk, talking to a lot of different people and their process. Um, so yeah, those were the influences growing up and. Um, Michael Jackson, maybe Michael Jackson. Uh, out of the kind of talk about a spectacle, his his just his quick movements sometimes is a surprise to the audience, and I've incorporated that too. Just where you're telling a joke, and you know the audience is there with you, and then you bust out into a, a physical move. It's unexpected. It takes them off guard. In this day and age, too, with everybody's attention being so fragmented, I mean. I I've like I got to give these people a show not only verbally but physically, and it keeps some people on their toes. You could you should you could see they're like they're almost like waiting for it. You know they're yeah. almost waiting for like a, a jolt or whatever. And Michael Jackson I, w watching him, uh, not only 
and his stage show too which now i'm kind of uh, as i'm doing munich the, man. theater show, Mu is that one of the ones that you in, uh, enjoyed watching the you told me about it i remember asking oh. you one time for like advice you're like michael jackson munich 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 germany and uh I was like, and, okay and, that's and, all he said <laughs> that's all he said <laughs> and budapest was also a good one <laughs> but his stage and and and, and light show uh which now i'm also looking at is <laughs> I am bringing in production for the show, you know, a uh, large screen, like a lot of what I do is in my face and you can't see it if you're in the balcony. Ah. So I brought in a large um, LED wall behind me where people now in the entire theater and when we do arenas, we do it in the round and we put a big screen above me where you could see it all. And the lights, I'm into... How do you light the audience? How do you light the stage? Do you light the stage when you're doing arena? Do you do you put a, like a laser light around the stage to outline it? All these different things I'm totally into, and that's why watching Michael Jackson and the stage show and seeing his bad tour when I was back in Chicago in 19, I think 85 or 90, I forget what it was, but I just was fascinated about the spectacle of the show. Yeah, it's at the end of the day. You got to make people laugh, right? Right. That's what they're there for, right? Are they going to notice that? Oh my God, he's got lights on this. They're not, but it's almost like it. It's you when you walk in, you create an environment for people, mm -hmm. and it's expected. And if you don't have it, I think it's it's noticeable. Hmm. Man, it's interesting how yeah, hospitality is such a thing in your life. You know, like uh, you do want to give them something. You want to give them something. You don't just want to take. Yeah, they're paying a, a, a high ticket price. Yeah. So you, you want to give them the enjoyment of going out and in, enjoying an experience rather than just a microphone and a, and a curtain. Yeah. And that's fine if you're doing that. But for me, being in that hospitality mindset, mm -hmm. I just want to give people a lot of options. You come to my house, I'm not just doing burgers. Right. I'm doing burgers, Italian sausage. I'm doing, uh, you know, I'm gonna have a little steak on the side. I put out a, a plethora of different things for people to enjoy, and it's always been in my head. I mean, it, it's and it's transferred into my career. Hmm. It, started, it started just me, Knowing the ins and out of hospitality, working for the Four Seasons Hotel, right. and, and anticipating people's expectations, and that's kind of what I'm doing in my shows. I'm trying to anticipate what people are wanting when they come out for an evening of comedy. Do you think that? Uh, do you have like an ideal show past the ones you've done? I mean, is it scary to go out into like an arena and and like uh, Madison Square Garden? Is it, is it scary to go out in these places and and have um, and feel like you're still doing comedy? It, it, no, I, I don't feel that at all. I feel like, oh, this is just a bigger setting. Mm -hmm. um, there's more pressure in the sense that, you know, doing a Madison Square Garden is kind of the epicenter of um, you know, New York City and the, the world's famous arena. So, yeah, there there is definitely an added pressure. But I feel like, wow, now I could really start entertaining people yeah wow really start showcasing what i do not that you have to be in an arena to do that but it brings a level of excitement that just isn't there in maybe a comedy club yeah i mean comedy club is great i love comedy clubs but um you know this it's just it's just another level of excitement for me and your dreams were in arenas it sounds like not, like, not really <clears throat> I, I didn't want i came up if you're setting of your dreams like you were thinking about a um Michael Jackson or something like that. You're like, you know, that or, you know, not that you're looking for that, but. It's in the back of my head. No, but if you see it, Michael Jackson, he's in an arena. It's yeah, like, yeah. you know, it's, there's something else in that environment, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I had it, I had it in me. Like if, if I ever got to a situation where I had to bring in lighting or bring in sound or what have you, that that's the way I would want to do it. Yeah. But ultimately, I mean, I came out to LA in 1998, and my goal was to do stand-up comedy for a living. That's it. That the, the was there was nothing else in the thing. There was no sitcom, no movie. I didn't want to do any of that. I just want I want to make people laugh, and I want to get paid for it. That's yeah. it. And uh, you know, it's grown a little bit past that. But uh, I was always kind of prepared of what I kind of wanted uh, if I ever did get there of how I wanted it to look. Mm. Aesthetics is big with me. Yeah, Jesus, you'd have been a, in, the most insane interior designer no, or magician. Well, it, no, I tell you, it's my wife though too. Really? Uh, well, here, I mean, look at you. 
you could just have this place as a um, you know gray walls and that's it. Uh, right. But you bring in you know this, you bring in the painting, you bring in the mural. You know, there's a lot of extra things here that you bring in to make the environment uh, what it is. And, yeah. And and, and That's I mean, true. Who, 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 you got to plant and get plants in here. For yeah. Christ's sake. And one of these, I think that one's an endangered species. Actually, I think just came out on. I got an email the other day. Actually, I don't know if we can have that anymore. <laughs> fucking california they're recalling everything it's living and they said that that plant sexually abused another plant about 30 oh, yeah. years ago and it says it right here so, <laughs> yeah there you go yeah it does say don't put it near female plants um let's take another question i'm gonna get through a couple more of these because i know the, our listeners are so excited yo yo what's good this is ron from los angeles oh, on, i want to ask if sebastian i want to ask about his time with andrew dice clay i know he toured with him for a little bit just curious to see uh if he was inspired by Dice, and if so, how? Uh, and also, if he has any just kind of crazy stories about being on the road with the Dice Man. Much love. Yeah, I dedicated a, a chapter in my book to going on the road with Dice Clay. Uh, so and I you did, were opening for him when he was at the top? I was opening up for him when he was primarily working in Las Vegas at the Stardust Hotel and the Wayne Newton Theater. So it was the first time I've actually ever done Vegas was with Dice, and the room was just a throwback to old vegas black and cushions uh you know like kind of like those um half moon couches yeah like at the comedy store kind of yeah yeah and kind of tiered uh really really nice and uh yeah he what i learned from dice is the spectacle of entertainment is is being uh kind of more than just uh, a guy that goes out there mm. and stands in front of a microphone again nothing wrong with that but uh, like i love that whole kind of you know, larger than life experience so yeah that's that's kind of what i learned from from the dice man and do fans love that too you think it's interesting you say this because I, I i i struggle with some of this sometimes like like i want to be authentic but you know we all we want to be as relatable as clark kent but we want also want to be we all want to put on a, a fucking cape sometimes excitement i guess that's what i would ex explain it to uh i'm talking about everyday things in my act i'm talking about the relationship with my father the relationship with my wife uh, the birthday party that we threw for my daughter, all these th different things, but doing it in a way where, you know, it, it you feel like you're watching a show. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's it. That's it. You could still be authentic and still be real, but you could also still give people a show. And to your point in the beginning of this, uh, this conversation was give people an, an, an entertainment entertaining environment, uh, which they feel like they are at something that is really special. Right. Yeah, it's man. I just I, I love seeing entertainment. And entertainment deserves a big show. Like I have a dream somewhere in my head of running across the stage and sliding on my knees across the stage. I don't know for what. Hey, sounds good to me, man. I would love to see a <laughs> Vaughn go through a through a, a slide on his knees. And, uh, I can hit <laughs> hit a light on the fucking stage. Yeah, get electrocuted. Man, why not, man? Uh, let's go to one more here. Hey, Theo, big fan. Both of you guys, you and Sebastian. I just wanted to say, uh, talk about the, if you can talk about Melokio again. Uh, my grandpa was a Greek man and my grandma is Spanish and they both have similar. I knew my grandma used to cover your face and gargle with salt water and spit on your forehead to get rid of it. Damn. That's he just, yeah, if you can delve more into that is basically where he goes with it. That's yeah. a Vietnamese facelift, I think, is what <laughs> that is, dude, if you want to do that. He's talking and referring to uh, the evil eye in Italian culture. Um, someone might put like a curse on you, mm -hmm. and they'll give you the, the evil eye, and, and they'll say something, and then you have like bad luck coming your way like voodoo yeah it's like voodoo and uh there's ways to combat this in the italian culture uh one of the ways is having an italian if you see those horns it's like a red horn hanging mm -hmm. off your um, rear rear view mirror in your your car kind of protecting you from any outside influence uh also there's a thing it's a it's a keychain and it's a hand that's like this and, and, yes. and you attach it to your Damn, how hard is it to be italian <laughs> it's difficult bro there are so <laughs> many rules um but all these things kind of combat this evil eye and in different cultures and to, to this guy's point with the greeks uh, yeah, see, there it is. You put that on your keychain, and that's supposed to really kind of keep the evil spirits away. Jesus Christ. Yeah. It looks like something from Dane Cook's gift shop. <laughs> 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 what the fuck, bro? 
Italians. They probably got this on some deal. These Italians. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, man. Now that I think about it, but this is like the way I grew up. Right. There's a horseshoe. Here's another one. There's a horseshoe that you have to, to, so this demon doesn't come into your house. Oh, yeah. You put a horseshoe and you flip it upside down. You got to put it over the door. And this, again, combats any type of, uh, any of the. Any oh, of the wow. Eye. Yeah, it's it's a lot. So every culture has their own thing. Yeah. Greek, Spanish, what have you. It's superstition. Yeah. Huh. They don't have that in the Nicaraguan culture. <laughs> Dude, I don't know what we had, man. My dad was so old when I was growing up. <clears throat> we used to have. I'm trying to think. You had an older father? Yeah, my dad was 70 when I was born. My dad was born in 1910. Wow. So, yeah, my dad was just old as heck, man. When I think he was cool, bro, but he had like big, you know, blood kind of spots on his skin and stuff. Like I had just weird influences growing up. Like I remember like drawing, like, you know, you get those liver spots on your skin because your liver's trying to get out of your body because it's sick of living with you once you get so old. And. I would draw those on my arm and stuff. So I'd be at school just like trying to look like my dad, you know, and I'd have all like these liver spots drawn on me and stuff. Just weird shit. I mean, it was fun though, too. You know, he was always joking around. Dude, he bought a Delta, a cutlass from somebody, right? A couple of brothers that lived a couple blocks over. He bought a cutlass from them and it had speakers in it, probably like 20. This is back when speakers mattered more than anything 20, 40 inches. Who gave a damn, you know? Mm -hmm. And. It had bass, but my dad, he was so, he couldn't hear it or feel any of it. He just got the car. He didn't care about the speakers, right? So he'd be listening to like Paul Harvey or NPR, just bass the fuck out, you know, like, Paul, Paul, Paul Harvey, good day. You know, just like listen to the weather report. I mean, it was just absolutely ridiculous. Wow. Uh, so just, that was kind of my world I grew up in where it was like, nothing mattered, you know, like, or like any, and nothing was off limits to joke about. You know, my brother would come in and be like, dad's dead. You know, like he fucking better not be dead, dude. Or he better be dead or I'm gonna whoop your ass. You know, like just the weirdest, you know, we'd take weird angles and stuff in communication. Wow, man, that is a different upbringing. But yeah, he was, uh, my dad was from Nicaragua. And then he, so he taught, he, he spoke a bunch of Spanish, but he didn't really teach us anything, you know? Um, so I don't know. He would talk in Spanish. He would flirt with some ladies over there. He'd let me go skip school and go sit at the bar with him and eat Hershey Kisses up there. I could eat 80 Hershey Kisses, bro. Wow. I'll put down two bags, bro. Wake up later in the backseat of that fucking Thunderbird, bro. Nothing wild had happened, but just, you know, sugar, sugar. intake. But anyway, it's kind of a boring story. Let's take one more and we'll get out of here. One more. Yo, Theo. Yo, Sebastian. Uh, it's Eric from Ca uh, Vancouver, Canada. Uh, Sebastian, I know you are very Italian. My girlfriend's Italian. I'm going to meet her whole Italian family at a family reunion next week. Just wondering if you got any advice for me. Advice in Italian reunion. Um, Chew with your mouth closed. I'm going to give him that advice right yeah, there. Yeah, the guy was kind of just polishing off his sandwich <laughs> there. <laughs> and... Uh, decided to make the, the video yeah and his phone looked dirty clean your phone <laughs> off bro you've been eating caramels or something clean your phone off yeah before you go to the reunion give your phone a nice <laughs> uh wipe down and uh yeah nothing i mean uh, just enjoy enjoy it there's gonna be it's gonna be loud and it's gonna be a lot of food hopefully and a lot of horseshoes so yeah. um yeah just enjoy yourself and uh and stop eating while you do videos. Yeah, tighten up, dude. You have a family. Um, I was gonna ask one. Uh, so, how, I've had, do you do you still are you still friends with Dice? You guys still close or no? I haven't talked to Dice. You I haven't talked to Dice in a while. I think the last time I saw Dice Clay was in the parking lot at the Comedy Store maybe two years ago. Yeah, yeah. Because I saw him like a year ago. And he was very. I thought he was very mean. I don't. I never worked with him or anything, but he was. Um, he just seemed like he was very too cool for school to the point where it wasn't cool. It was like, we can't be too cool for, maybe you can be too cool for everything, you know? Like he was too cool to even act like we were working on the same show at all, that he brought me on stage. He kept fucking my name up, but like on purpose at a certain point where it was just like, you know. So I got up there, I was like, give it up, you guys give it up for Andrew. You know, I don't know if that's his real name or not. Uh, or Andy, I don't know what I called him, or Drew, something. But anyway, 
Maybe that's my. Maybe I have my own resentment, and I don't know why I'm trying to <laughs> ask you about it. I think I do. <laughs> well, I'm sorry you had that experience. No but, worries. Uh, is it hard to be? Uh, do you find? Do you find that comics the Brotherhood is pretty good overall? The Brotherhood of Comedians. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. I, th- I think it is. I mean, uh, again, actually, I listened to Joe Rogan talk about this with Burke Kreischer and Tom Segura yesterday on his podcast, saying that now more than ever, the camaraderie amongst comedians is is uh, is fantastic. I mean, everybody's happy for one another. Or maybe uh, in the past that wasn't the the case. Mm. Uh, people would be like jealous or like, oh, why'd he get that? Why'd she get that? Or what have you. I mean, that's that element is still there. But you see a lot of comedians now kind of like hanging out and, 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 and doing it together rather mm-hmm. than doing it on their own. And I think you're uh, part of that like group of, of guys, the, the fighter and the kid and, and the Rogans and the Kreischers and the Seguras seem to be all like buddies and you know, one goes on one show, another and they have Yeah, real supportive. Supportive. And it's great, you know, like some somebody's Netflix special comes out. Everybody posts, hey, watch Bert, watch Theo, watch this, watch that. So, yeah, I think it's really, really great. Um, for myself, I just, uh, you know, being uh, on the outside, I've, I've never really, yeah. <laughs> really been yeah. a part of any comedic clique. Um, you know, I, I, come up, I came up with a few guys um, in, in the late 90s, like the Brett Ernst of the world, the Ahmeds, the Caparulos were kind of, Steve Byrne, yeah. all in our kind of class. It was like a class at the comedy store. Like everybody got passed and then we kind of went up together. But um, other than that, no, but you're I, always on the perimeter a little. But you're always you're just the same, just perceiving kind of. Yeah, because you do seem like you don't seem like a guy that's rude or anything. But you seem like a guy that's yeah, maybe just kind of. I don't know if it's hard to get to know. Yeah, I am. I I, I, I create a very very uh, tough shell. It's it's. I don't let a lot of people in, but when I do, you're a friend for life. Wow. And um, and, and and I don't know. Again, that's I think by. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what the mechanism is, but I've always been a little bit standoffish with people and it could come off as abrasive, rude or aloof, but it's a little bit more of the fact that, uh, I am deep down a shy guy mm. and don't, I don't like to expose myself a lot. I don't like to talk a lot. It's, it's not something I enjoy doing. Wow. You are the strangest dude, bro. <laughs> You are the strangest dude, bro. You being an endangered species, man. You probably who the rest of you left the earth a long time ago. Oh, yeah, you're no. still out here milling around. They're all up in I'm heaven. A, like, how is this fucking? How did guy this still guy out survive out here? He don't talk to nobody. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I know this guy. No, I mean, are you going over? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, again, I'm not opposed to I'm not opposed to having friendships. No, I, I wanna, it doesn't seem like it. But you know, I for whatever the reason always felt like it was hard for me to fit in. Yeah, that's that's the main thing. Do you feel like it was hard for you to do so, or do you feel like people didn't accept you in? I think a lot of it's in my head. Right. I think I'm talking a lot in my head, going, oh, I, don't know, it's, it's, I don't know if this guy's gonna like me or this. I don't yeah. know if this group's gonna <laughs> like me, whatever. So I think I, I, I talk myself out of a lot of things. Uh, and actually, my wife has helped me with uh, being a lot more uh, accepting and open to other uh, people because mm. she's that way. She's from Memphis, Tennessee. She's from the South. She's happy. She's I come on like the more the merrier. And she's kind of opened that side of me that I never really had uh growing up uh or in my early adulthood so she's been a huge influence of of you know opening our house and come on in like she's the type like hey, stay with us for the weekend and i'm right. like Can, can't you get a hotel <laughs> you know like that's 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 the dynamic but i've learned a lot learned a lot in the last 10 years from her that's cool man yeah. um let's take uh let's take one last call i sure. know he wanted to put it in here uh, we're getting pretty slim pickings, but this guy, okay. this guy cracked me up. Okay. Just wanted to know when you're coming to Australia. <laughs> hey, let's get organized. Wow. <laughs> Who is that? 
you know that guy? He, that's a line from my podcast, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, so he must be a podcast listener. What is it? First of all, what is it with Australians always wanting us to come? That's all they ever ask on social media. When are you coming? When are you coming? coming? Because they're in the middle of nowhere. They're, 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 they, need, uh, they need company. Um, Australia, I am coming to 2019. We don't know when. I went there, I think it was a year and a half ago, two years ago, and I uh, had a great time there, my wife and I. Uh, and we're definitely wanting to go back. It's just the scheduling hasn't opened up enough time to kind of go and do that. But uh, 2019, I have a really, really good fan base there. A lot of Italians and uh, probably 2019, yeah. Do you see yourself doing like, um, you know, like I know you've worked in some television and film. Like, is that something that you've, that you're still like, does it feel like an aim? I feel like these days the power feels like it's in the stand up more than anything these days. It's just in the actual stage show. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, I've been doing a couple movies uh, here and there, but I like doing serious movies. I don't like, not that I don't like doing um, mm -hmm. comedy. I like exercising a more uh, serious um, muscle because uh, I'm like a serious guy. Yeah. Uh, and I like to do more of a dramatic type of movie. There's one coming out this uh, November 21st called The Green Book, which is a really, really good movie. And I uh, really enjoyed working with like some some serious actors you know um so it's a nice departure from the stand-up yeah i uh, plan on doing more of it but you're right i think you know the bread and butter is the, the stand-up that's that's where that's where it is at least for me yeah do you feel like like what would be, do you have an ideal kind of role like a maitre d that fucking you know goes to you know um, uh, like a um, james bond sort of a maitre d that um that maybe uh i don't know when I was working at the Four Seasons, I always look at people that I didn't particularly like waiting on, mm -hmm. and um, maybe like, something there. Like maybe Matro like Dexter. Ma Matro. De <laughs> I could see that. That's a good one. I mean, yeah, like room they, service. They they didn't tip, <laughs> and then later on, when they're in the parking lot, there's, the fifth there's, season. Yeah. yeah, the fifth <laughs> season with Sebastian Maniscalco. <laughs> Man, I feel this is the most. This is the guest I've been mo most excited to have. Man, we've had some really great guests in here, and um, but yeah, dude. I, I mean, I just I know it's hard to like get to know you, and uh, you know, like uh, you know, because you just are kind of like kind of keep to yourself a little bit. But it's not because you're a mean guy or anything. No, no. I mean, again, like uh, we have parties at the house, and and you know, it, it's just like I don't, I don't, I don't really have a lot of people's. <laughs> Like I, I've known you for what fifteen years. I don't even think I got your phone number. You know, like I see him all the time at the comedy store. He was in um, where the hell were you at the Brigada right before you were going to oh, do your yeah. special in New Orleans? I remember I was doing the little. I was doing some dump truck outside. I was performing in right a nine seat truck that had been hollowed out, and I walk in and there he's in the back making wine. He's got an open or some guy, some guy, dude, Joe, uh, somebody, Matt, Matt Reese. Reese. Yeah, he's got his shoes off and he's got on a uh they're playing that i love lucy in the background and joe's making wine with his feet in there for sebastian <laughs> sebastian's tested it from the side uh, with a spoon like ratatouille uh, <laughs> too bitter joe keep <laughs> yeah. keep moving on the but it was this big room and i even just went on stage and just looked out i was like wow this is fascinating um yeah, so all these years I've known you, you know, I never exchange information. Although I don't even know if people are doing that anymore. I mean, like, if I want to get a hold of you, I hit you up on like the, the messenger on Instagram now. I mean, I don't even know how it works, bro. I don't even know how you ended up here today. <laughs> how the hell did I get here? I don't even have this guy's number. I just walked in. He's sitting on like on a throne, waiting for me to walk in. Hey, I put with his this vest, vest on. on. Dude, I wanted to dress the place up a little. We lit two candles, even though it's illegal in here. Oh, is that what? You, uh, you don't normally do this? No, the guy at the front, man, he'll shut it down, bro. He's like an RA at a dorm, at a Catholic dorm, dude. He don't care if there's dead bodies. Is there a candle lit? <laughs> Fucking shut it down. Oh, man. man um, yeah, well, thank you so much for coming, man. Thank you. Congratulations on all your success, dude. And uh, thanks for leading the way for... Uh, for entertainers, man, it makes it may, I think it's gonna make a lot of young guys want to get on stage that want to be entertainers because we haven't seen it in a long time. Well, thanks, man. I, I'm just, uh, I'm just. That's very nice of you to say. Thank you. Yeah, you bet, Sebastian Maniscalco, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go.
gonna take a little time for me to set that parking brake and let myself all wind shine. Wow, you know what's crazy is my sister can't even read. But what does it have to do with us right now? Hope you enjoyed that video, and you can watch another. And you can watch this one, you can watch this one. Different options, different choices. Some guy just brings you one option, not this guy. Two options. Watch one. This one or this one.